So hello everybody, uh, as you're joining, we'll give it uh, a few seconds before we begin. Um, my name's Claire Healy, and I'm moderating today's uh, press briefing. Uh, the, today's briefing is hosted by E3G, we're an independent climate change think tank, and Climate Nexus, which is a strategic communications group. Um, I'll just say a word about how we're going to handle the next 45 minutes. Uh, we'll, be we'll be hearing from opening remarks from our panelists, um, and then we'll be taking your questions. Uh, please, this is primarily a press briefing, so I will be prioritizing questions from journalists. Please put your questions in the Q&A box uh, with your name and your news outlet. For those dialing in by phone, if you have a question, you can email it to press at e3g.org, and that question will be uh, put through the Q&A box. And if you don't get a chance to ask your question, though, um, please email us thereafter. I need to uh, remind everybody this call is on the record and we will be recording and the recording will be made available afterwards. Okay, so let's begin. Um, I just wanna say at the outlet, now this conversation, while it's focused on the energy frame of the war in Ukraine and looking at the geopolit geopolitical consequences uh, and through a climate change lens, I want to say off the bat that this is a war. In my view, it's unwarranted and people are dying and suffering and fighting and fleeing and making awful decisions with their families about what to do here. So this is very much like you, I'm sure, like personally anguished when you hear these very personal stories um, about how people having to make these decisions. So I wanna say that at the outset. Um, but on the radio this morning, um, not just the headlines, what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, we heard about President Biden, who is expected, if he hasn't already, uh, announced a ban on US imports of Russian oil. The Europeans have just ended their press conference where they have launched their plan to wean themselves of Russian gas before 2030. The price of gallon, this was also on the radio, a top news item, is $4.17, according to the Wall Street Journal, the highest it's ever been, surpassing previous records in 2008. But also on the news, a top news item in the, in, on the radio was the flooding in Sydney in Eastern Australia, and people there also having to evacuate their homes. So we wanna have this conversation and look at the entanglement between energy, security, and the geopolitics that the war in Ukraine sort of illustrates. And in the past, when there have been such energy price shocks, we've seen systemic shifts. And we're hoping to see such a shift as a result of this shock, but towards a clean energy uh, transition and clean energy future. Because the safety of all citizens uh, really requires Europe, US, Canada, and all partners to cooperate to tackle the multiple crises we face most immediately stopping the war in Ukraine, but in a way that doesn't make the other crisis, climate change, any worse. So today we're gonna, we have, we're gonna be exploring the options available to the US and Canada to assist Europe in particular facing this energy security issue. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna ask, um, uh, I'll introduce our, our sort of guests. Uh, we have with us today, Maria Pastakova, a colleague of mine based in Berlin, she's a senior policy advisor that looks at energy systems. We have Ted Nace, the founder and executive director of Global Energy Monitor. We have Admiral Dennis McGinn, former assistant secretary of the Navy for energy installations and environment, and Mahira Sora from the Sierra Club. So we're gonna be covering a wide gambit of issues and different perspectives of the current crisis. So I'm gonna start asking Maria to share her opening remarks, in particular, what do we hear from the Europeans as they've just ended their press conference? Maria. Uh, thanks a lot, Claire, and, and hello, everyone. Um, so the EU, as, as Claire just said, has come out with its own communication on energy prices and its approach uh, to, um, to the current energy crisis. And what we see now on the EU energy policy front um, within this communication um, is the really long due 
a long already acknowledgement of the need to rapidly accelerate the process on the EU Green Deal and the Fit for 55 goals. Um, the communication that you just re released on the um, energy price acknowledges that the clean energy shift is in fact the fastest and most efficient uh, and cheapest way to decrease uh, um, the Russian gas consumption and increase the EU's energy assistance resilience. Um, uh, as one can see from the communication, the Commission for the first time directly links the Fit for 55 2030 target to a potential gas consumption reduction of um, and now um, 155 BCM, which is over 30% uh, of European gas demand, uh, which really shows that the European Green Deal is um, a crucial part of the answer to the current geopolitical threats. And uh, with its Repower Europe uh, update to the 55 policies that has been announced today, the EU aims to um, eliminate the dependence on Russian gas supplies altogether. 150, 155 BCM of gas is approximately what Russia delivered to Europe back in 2019. Um, and um, the, this dependency can be reduced by over two thirds already um, by the end of this year. Um, what we also see is that the EU uh, had learned one lesson which it had had to learn in a really hard way uh, in the wake of this crisis that the EU's slow progress on energy transition um, has posed a major security risk and um, now it's really signals the readiness to double down its efforts, um, assure, ensuring the resilience of energy systems and economy to the external geopolitical shocks uh, is now uh, a priority um, on the way out of the Ukraine crisis. Um, and um, the, maybe the most important thing here is uh, that we see the doubling down and transition is now being seen not just a long-term priority by 2030, it is uh, now being seen as a powerful instrument to reduce the reliance on Russia's oil and gas, coal, oil and gas, more like in the short term as well. Um, the uh, uh, focus on the overall energy security debate has now shifted away from the sole focus, focus on shifting um, the fossil fuel supplies, for example, or diversifying them, or just decarbonizing the supply, but also addressing the demand side measures where energy efficiency is at, at heart of the measures. And uh, as you probably have seen in the communication or will read in the communication, the approach uh, the EU now takes is based on the efficiency first principle, which is uh, you need to take an energy efficiency measures as the first uh, solution. And if that doesn't work or can't deliver, the rest can be delivered by other decarbonization measures. Um, diversifying LNG supplies, of course, plays a central role here, um, both as a short-term and a long-term measure to address the Russian aggression and reduce the dependence on Russian gas. Um, and, and here the EU takes an even more ambitious approach than the um, IA suggested last week within, within its 10 points um, directive, uh, where they suggested to diversify uh, up to 30 BCM of, of gas uh, by the end of this year. Um, the EU takes an even more ambitious scope for diversification by the end of this year with additional 60 BCM uh, or with diversifying away from 60 BCM of Russian gas towards 50 BCM of LNG and 10 BCM of uh, pipeline gas from additional suppliers. Um, so the EU does talk about the, the diversification and um, also about strategically approaching the gas storage issue where um, the communication now says that um, there will be um, a directive coming out in April that requires the um, storage suppliers, uh, uh, storage utilities to um, store up to 90% um, of, um, of gas uh, by, by October 1st every year. Um, but given the overall goal of reducing uh, over 30% of overall gas demand and the diversification measures that will be taken this year, the EU doesn't talk about boosting um, the uh, LNG production, for example. So the 60 BCM that will be diversified this year are the 60 BCM that will remain diversified throughout to 2030. Um, there, is, there are no further plans to, to boost any, any additional energy supplies uh, in, in two or three years. So basically the rest of the diversification will need to play, take place in Europe uh, within or by, um, by decarbonization measures. Um, I will, maybe we'll stop here for now um, and uh, look forward to the questions. Thank you, Maria. Um, let's hear from Ted next. Ted, uh, from Global Energy Monitor, what's your perspective, and particularly on the US side, what's its capacity and ability to meet this uh, demand? Uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, Global Energy Monitor released a report this morning titled Gas Run Aground, which explains the situation with approximately 21 LNG export terminals under consideration in the US. 
and why these terminals are not getting financial support and moving ahead. Right now, there are tremendous pressures for using the current crisis in Europe to change the equation for these terminals. I'm gonna talk about why the situation really has not fundamentally changed. It's true that methane gas markets are out of balance right now and prices for gas are at high levels but it is important to make a distinction between these short-term conditions and the longer-term conditions, which are increasingly unfavorable for large LNG export projects. As we describe in the report, not a single one of the 71 LNG trains in, in pre-construction in the US has received a final investment decision since the beginning of 2021. And the same is true for over a dozen export trains under consideration in Canada. There are very good reasons that investors are not eager to invest in LNG export. The first reason for investor reluctance is climate change. Under the IEA's net zero by 2050 scenario, LNG exports must peak in this decade for the world to have a 50% chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. And LNG exports must decline by 60% by 2050. For LNG facilities that are under consideration now, investors must bet that the world will not stiffen its regulatory response to climate change, not just this year and not just next year, but during the entire first half of the century. The second reason for investor reluctance is the global dynamics of supply. Even for those willing to bet that climate regulation will not get in the way of LNG, the expected growth in gas demand does not support further large expansion of US LNG export capacity. Wood Mackenzie forecasts that by 2030, global LNG demand will grow to 560 million tons per annum. But export facilities in construction or operating already account for 515 million tons. So that leaves only 45 million tons of opportunity. And that is the big question, who will grab this last slice of the pie? The answer does not look particularly good for US terminal promoters. For purposes of reference, 45 million tons is slightly smaller than a single large terminal in Cotter called Cotter North. And so one more facility in Cotter could grab the entire slice that US promoters are hoping for. Cotter in particular is a low, lower cost supplier than the US and has been very aggressive about expanding its export capacity. Cotter Petroleum had no trouble reach, reaching FID in 2021 for a massive new terminal. The third reason for investor reluctance is competition from renewables. The narrative behind LX, LNG expansion has rested heavily on the idea of gas replacing coal in Asia, based on the assumption that renewables cannot replace firm base load power as Asia shifts away from coal. And the same logic applies in Europe. That underlying assumption is increasingly out of date. A good illustration is the December 2021 report by the Australian government agency CSIRO. That report looked at solar PV and wind in relation to gas for generating electricity. And it included system integration, load shaping, and battery storage costs. By 2030, CSIRO forecasts the levelized cost of wind and solar to be running at about half the levelized cost of gas for power generation. So the comparison was apples to apples, firm gas power against firm renewable power. That level of competitive pressure on gas in the power sector within less than a decade becomes a very significant risk factor for anyone investing in 30 year LNG, LNG expansion. To summarize, Traditionally, infrastructure was a category of investment that was considered both boring and safe. But LNG export infrastructure is definitely not boring and safe these days. Climate activists will go to great lengths to stop these projects from being built. And as long as they're operating, they will go to great lengths to see them prematurely retired. Meanwhile, renewables keep getting cheaper and overseas competitors are getting very aggressive about grabbing the last slice of available opportunity. So it is no wonder that LNG export terminals are having so much difficulty finding financial backers, despite what happens in the short term to be a favorable business climate, and despite the pressures that are, that are, uh, that are appearing to use the current 
short-term crisis in Europe to justify long-term LNG expansion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nace. Um, I have lots of questions myself, but I'll refrain. Um, uh, I would like to call next uh, Admiral McGinn. Admiral, if you could say a word from your perspective. Um, with the sure. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I want to start by saying what we are witnessing in Ukraine is an illegal, illogical, and immoral use of power by Russia against a, nation, a sovereign nation that uh, does not pose a threat to Russia as a state or the Russian people. It is, uh, we are witnessing via various media, video, et cetera, uh, social media, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes against humanity. And I was really glad to know that the International Court of uh, Criminal Court is going to take this uh, issue up. There are no winners in war, and this is going to have a lot of losers. Right now, the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian infrastructure, building, economy, uh, and lives uh, destroyed or, or maimed forever. So we have to do whatever we can to stop. The good news is that the United States and our European allies and, and partners around the world have come together to say, look, this will not stand. Uh, we are going to hold Russia accountable and Putin accountable for as long as it takes for them to come to their senses and get out of Ukraine. Let me talk about energy. If Europe and the United States to an extent were further down the path to decarbonization, this never would have happened. Let's face it, the uh, economics for Russia are very, very appealing. It's created uh, a war chest, if you will, of, uh, of money and capability as a result of their exportation of uh, what the world effectively is still addicted to. My hope is that as we get through the near-term challenges of uh, helping Ukraine and getting back to some semblance of normal on the European continent, we will continue to accelerate decarbonization and get off fossil fuel. Make no mistake, if we were not addicted as an international community to fossil fuel, this war never would have happened. So in order to avoid future wars fought over oil or gas or other fossil resources, we need to accelerate the transition to a new, new uh, energy economy that uh, is focused on clean, sustainable energy. Make no mistake, our energy security, whether it's considered in a national sense or international sense, our, our energy security, our economic security, and our environmental security are all inextricably linked. You can't do much in any one of those areas without having a tremendous effect on the others. And we also need to understand that uh, energy, economy, environment are the underpinning layers of our international security and our quality of life. So we need to change our portfolio. We need to diversify it. We need to decarbonize as quickly as possible. We, we should not let anything stand in the way in a policy sense of moving forward much, much faster on the path to decarbonization and creating a diverse portfolio of energy. In the near term, obviously, not just in Europe, but uh, pretty much in a lot of places, energy efficiency is absolutely necessary. We are gonna to have to learn to deal with less, less natural gas, less oil, certainly in the, in the uh, near term, but it will help move us to a better energy economy in the future. We need to electrify where we are currently using natural gas, for example, or uh, oil or gas uh, for transportation, for industry, for residential uses. We need to substitute clean energy. And I think Europe has been on a good path, just not far enough down that path to decarbonization. Uh, we need to do everything we can as nations and as international allies to accelerate that path to uh, decarbonization and a diversified portfolio. I'll use one example. Uh, Europe has really, really gotten into the offshore wind business. 
that allows us to put very, very many uh, electrons, uh, gigawatts, if you will, close to uh, load centers, populations, uh, cities, and that needs to accelerate. But it's not any one thing. It's a whole ra a range of, uh, of opportunities for us to really accelerate the decarbonization and get off our addiction to fossil fuel. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Jen. Thank you, Admiral. Um, questions that are coming in, please do put them in the Q&A box and identify your outlet so I can prioritize uh, journalists. Um, okay, so without further ado, our last contributor, uh, Mahira Saru from the Sierra Club uh, on the perspective of the US and this, the, the banning of Russian uh, imports of oil seems to have bipartisan support. So if you could say what's going on uh, up there on the hill, that would be great. Mahira. Thank you. Uh, so just to begin, I, I would just like to say that the Sierra Club joins with the millions here in the United States and across the world in support of the Ukrainian people and call on the United States government to continue taking immediate action to support the people facing unimaginable loss. A secure and sustainable global environment is an intrinsic part of universal human rights and is indispensable to a secure society. The security of that right and of all nations depends on an environmentally sustainable, economic, cultural, and political structures and policies. As Ukrainians suffer from Putin's war atrocities, the fossil fuel industry is seeking to exploit this crisis to increase their bottom line. Make no mistake, polluters and their front groups aren't advocating for solutions to help anyone but themselves. Time and again, polluters have used geopolitical strife and war to falsely drive the use of volatile fossil fuels. API and corporate polluters are attempting to exploit war and the suffering of millions to line their pockets by locking in decades of dependence on fossil fuels through new and expanded LNG export facilities, drilling in the Arctic refuge, and even the long dead Keystone XL pipeline. For months, oil and gas companies have used the cover of inflation to rise prices and boost their bottom line. And now they're attempting to double down under the cover of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Current gas shortages in Europe and the spiking home heating costs Americans have experienced this winter are both symptoms of our continued reliance on fossil fuels. As long as we rely on volatile global commodities like oil and gas, we'll always be vulnerable to geopolitics and the whims of greedy fossil fuel executives and the politicians they finance. Fossil fuel industry proponents are cynically trying to use the current crisis to justify a massive long-term expansion of fossil fuel development and exports, which would do nothing to help Europe in the short term and would only serve to lock in reliance on risky fossil fuels for decades to come. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said it best, real energy security comes from reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. That is why investments in clean energy, like those proposed by President Biden, will increase our energy supply and help accelerate the production of cheaper, cleaner energy here in the United States. This greater push for renewable energy would also help to achieve US energy independence. The United States Congress in this moment must reject any attempts to use Russia's invasion of Ukraine to expand oil and gas drilling and fast track LNG export facilities. As the IEA's latest global energy outlook confirms, the continued expansion of gas extraction and LNG exports is incompatible with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. If the US were to maintain its current path between now and 2050, the emissions associated with oil, gas, and gas liquids extracted from the Permian Basin alone would equal 10% of the entire world's remaining carbon budget under a 1.5 degrees Celsius warming scenario. Stopping the expansion of LNG exports is critical if the Biden administration wishes to meet its commitment to the COP26 Global Methane Pledge and its goal to curb global methane emissions by at least 30% from 2020 levels by 2030. The energy consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine are proof that the world cannot wait for a global transition to clean energy. Congress must swiftly move forward with a historic suite of investments in communities and families struggling with the interlocking crises of climate change, health, 
Economic Inequity and Racial and Environmental Injustice. That work begins this week as Congress considers a federal budget that invests in our communities and workers. This bill, not a continuing resolution, can and must be passed before the government funding deadline this Friday. There is also a supplemental funding request for $12 billion in aid for Ukraine that may be attached to the normal funding legislation. Our country cannot afford another temporary fix. Congress must pass a clean federal budget and supplemental proposal without poison pill policy riders that reflect the Biden administration's agenda to protect our communities, invest in America and its workers by creating sustainable jobs and combating the climate crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you to all our contributors. Um, I'm looking now at the questions um, and I will, um, the, the, coming in thick and fast. Um, so we'll start by, there are a couple of questions from um, Ella Nilsson from CNN uh, for Ted. Ted, uh, we'll start with um, a, a question on what are the relative emissions from US LNG compared to Russian gas via pipelines? Another one on, and there's more detailed numbers about methane and methane leakage or the in methane intensity of US gas, saying US and Russia, neither of have very good performance according to the IEA methane tracker. Um, US could actually be higher. So if your perspective on that. Um, and then some other questions. So Ted, we'll go to you first for those and then I'll bring in the others. Are renewables ready for the moment? What are some of the hurdles that renewable energy sector have to overcome? how quickly renewables could ramp up in Europe. And also um, a question for Admiral McGinn on um, Russia also supplies critical inputs to the renewable energy sector. So if we're going to decarbonize, will that also be an issue? So I'll, I'll weave these out a bit more and the others that come in, but first Ted, if you could answer Ella's questions on the uh, emissions from LNG, Ted. Yeah, so there's been some recent messaging by the American Petroleum Institute to the effect that US LNG is somehow some kind of climate advantage compared to Russian gas. Um, and what we have to go by, first of all, you have to separate out upstream emissions and leakage from midstream emissions. So just to talk first about the upstream emissions, um, neither the US or, nor Russia is very, is very good at, on the global scale. So Russia is estimated by the, by the, um, by the EPA's, um, I'm sorry, by the IEA's uh, methane tracker to be uh, 0 0.29 kilograms of methane per gigajoule. So 0 0.29 kilograms, the US is 0 0.22 kilograms, but uh, one thing that needs to be, and, 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 and just to put that in perspective, Saudi Arabia is 0.11 and Norway is close to zero. So Russia 0.29, US 0.22, Saudi Arabia 0.11 and um, Norway close to zero. But the US uh, methane intensity of 0.22 is actually a mixture of gas from fracked and non-fracked. And right now any increases will come from fracked. Fracked sources are 50% higher in intensity than non-fract sources. So in terms of the upstream impacts, comparing the US to Russia, there's no advantage for switching to US supplies from a methane leakage standpoint. So that's at the upstream. In terms of the midstream impacts, uh, it depends on the length of the supply chain and how good the pipelines are. So for US gas, it depends on where it's coming from, how long of a pipe it has to run through, and then the, uh, then the leakage losses from, of bringing LNG across an ocean. And with respect to Russia, again, the, 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 the equation would have to do with how long the pipeline is from the gas supply and how good the pipelines are. So the fact is those, those, those leakage rates have not been well studied on the Russian side. And on the US side, they're not looking that good either. But it's, it's impossible at this point to make that kind of apples to apples comparison. And if the API is saying definitively that US uh, gas is better from a climate perspective. They really don't have the evidence to do that. Okay, good. Thank you, Ted. And thank you for putting in some more of that analysis in the chat function. Perhaps you could put your email. So if Ella has additional questions, she can follow up with you. Um, we have a question for Admiral McGinn. Um, and this is from, I'm trying to find, um, 
This is from uh, Gile from e, e News. So, um, Admiral McGinn, like if you said the um, if Europe was further along in its decarbonisation efforts and the world wasn't so addicted to fossil fuels, this war would never have happened. Uh, but as, uh, as it's pointed out, Russia produces key minerals for energy, for clean energy like nickel and um, aluminum. And the prices of those metals are also going crazy right now amid this conflict. So is the war going to slow down the pace of decarbonizing by sort of the instability in these essential uh, commodity prices? If you could say a bit on that, and then I'll also turn to um, Maria then about are renewables ready for the moment and what is the ability for sure. Europe to ramp those up? Admiral, well, first to you. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Uh, clearly, the um, international markets are in turmoil as a result of this uh, illegal uh, aggression by Russia into Ukraine and all of the, uh, all of the repercussions of that. Uh, key metals for which for use in many, many uh, products, including uh, renewable energy, uh, electronic vehicles or electric vehicles. Uh, yeah, those uh, prices are very volatile and rising right now. I am convinced it's a temporary phenomenon. We have realized uh, internationally that we need to diversify uh, not just our how our energy is produced, but where we get the materials to produce that cleaner energy. So uh, whether you're talking about uh, cobalt or, or lithium, uh, nickel, more co common um, metals like uh, copper in higher demand right now, but I do not see it appreciably slowing down the transition to uh, a clean energy portfolio. Uh, it is just this uh, market uh, turbulence that is caused by this, uh, this terrible war uh, by Russia. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. But there is no easy answer here, even the shift to renewables. Uh, there are obstacles and challenges. Maria, could you come in and say something about is Europe ready for this moment? Are they able to ramp up renewables to meet this shortfall? And more generally, if Ted or other, uh, you want to talk about some of the other hurdles the renewable energy sector faces. Maria. Thanks, Claire. And um, I absolutely agree with uh, Mr. McGinn on um, on, on the really the, the effect that this, this crisis will have, it will accelerate uh, uh, the action. And we see definitely the prices are now a challenge, uh, particularly the prices on nickel, the prices on steel. And in the midterm, uh, we're talking five years, for example, here, yeah. and in the long term, as ensuring uh, functioning uh, supply and value chains for critical raw materials, but also for uh, renewable energy equipment must be a priority. And there, and this is probably one of the most promising areas for uh, cooperation uh, between the US and the EU uh, in this context, um, as both our industrial powerhouses and, and uh, have a massive financial and innovation potential. Uh, transparent and accountable critical materials market will be important and that cooperation with China will also be crucial. But what we have seen from this crisis is that, um, is that uh, things that have taken a very long time previously and where um, the basically the reasoning has been, it's not easy, decarbonization is not easy. Uh, these things can uh, suddenly happen very quickly. We see the readiness of Europe to, to pay the necessary price, even amid surging prices right now in the market, and, and to prioritize this de de development. I think a really telling example is uh, its action on Ukraine, uh, where the discussions about synchronization of the Ukrainian power grid with the European network have been going on for years, and uh, the uh, preliminary decision has been uh, to uh, make it happen, to start making it happen by the end of this year. Now, in the wake of the crisis, uh, suddenly it is possible within two weeks. And and the same the same can be really said about the um, the speed that that is realistic on on deploying renewables um, in terms of how well uh, prepared the the renewable supply chains are for for this action. Uh, this, the solar supply chains are definitely very well prepared, uh, particularly for, for something that can be done in the short term. Uh, and uh, we have seen from the estimates by the IEA and other analysts that um, even this year, by just accelerating the projects that are already in the pipeline, we can bring down gas use by 6 PCM uh, by uh, the end of 2022. Um, this uh, can be... Uh, 
so th this this can be basically uh, extrapolated to the to the coming years as well. Uh, so accelerating solar um, is not a problem neither now nor in the midterm. Wind uh, is is a bit more challenging given uh, its high dependency on the steel markets. Um, but there, uh, it is definitely not a dead end, and and there just the cooperation on sustainable green steel supply and value chains probably is 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 key um, when we talk about transatlantic cooperation. Uh, thank you, thank you, Maria. Um, and as Yael points out, it is um, co controversial. Many analysts say that the the instability in commodities, particularly the metals, it's not a uh, it's not a short term phenomenon. It's not temporary. It's going to be permanent. If you want to come back in on that, but first, I just want to call on Sarah from E and E News. I think you had your hand raised. Are you able to ask your question verbally? Sarah. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for the the opportunity. This is um, and thank you all for taking part in this. Just had a question about. Um, so the differences in, in the approach between the EU and the US, um, the, the EU seems to be using this as a moment to accelerate its push for renewables. And we're not hearing that same message come out of the US. And I'm curious what impact that will have on the climate goals um, globally as a result. Uh, good question. Uh, Mahara, do you want to come in on that question? Sure, I can I can jump in briefly. Uh, so, I guess my, the comment that I will make is that to to us, we see President Biden and the Biden administration um, prioritizing investments in in clean energy, and the, not only are they doing so in 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 administrative advocacy, but of course in in what they'd like to see uh, a part of their broader uh, agenda, a climate agenda. And so, for us, uh, we we look forward to. To, to watching and waiting as the Biden administration continues to prioritize clean energy. And as I named White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki has already talked about our need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So ever more the reason to, to continue boosting up and ramping up uh, our need to invest in, in a renewable energy future. So I will say that, but- my Thank you. Um, jump in. Well, I've got a question for you also. I uh, will come back to you in a moment from uh, Dharma Noor on the fossil fuel companies price gouging, but just on the different perspectives between Europe and the US or different responses, Maria, sitting in Berlin, what do you see coming out of the US in terms of uh, uh, sort of similarities and differences with the Europe and how they're facing this? You mean how, um, how, how the US could react to the crisis well, in yeah, terms of... That to Sarah's question, it sounds like Europe, given their press conference today, and you said the numbers that they've said are even more ambitious than the IEA 10 point yes. plan. So it seems like they're double, doubling down on this transition, including energy efficiency. They're talking about heating um, and the demand side as much as the supply side. Um, and so, but as Sarah said, we're not feeling that yet, at least from the US side, right? Uh, the, the, conversate, the discourse here is very much Will consumers uh, bear the price at the pump? Uh, maybe it's unfair to ask you that if you're in Berlin. Ted, do you have perspectives on that? Right. Well, the difference is that Europe is not really a, a huge energy producer, whereas the U.S. is a big, oil, you know, it's the leading oil producer in the world. And so, you know, in in the in in Europe, there all sectors of society basically have an interest in you know reducing dependence, and renewables are now the quickest. And, the, and, and becoming, it's more apparent that renewables are also the most secure uh, way of expanding energy availability. Also, the, you know, just the opportunity in, in simple things that can be very quickly, be quickly deployed like heat pumps. There's a huge opportunity to, for, for that kind of simple measure. Um, and, um, you know, in the US, the politics are scrambled because uh, oil interests and, and gas interests have, have uh, you know, have have sort of a decisive veto power over the U.S. plans to decarbonize. So that's a difference between Europe and the United States. Claire, if I may, um, I would uh, uh, quote a former Saudi Arabian oil minister who once said, "We must remember that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone, and the age of fossil fuel 
will not end because we run out of fossil fuel. It's because we will have discovered better ways of producing the goods and services that are, are needed uh, for a high quality of life and good robust economies. In the United States, um, it isn't the technology, and in more recently, recent years, it isn't the finance that tends to stand, stand in the way of accelerating the scale up and the pace of adoption of clean energy, whether it's energy efficiency or renewable energy or, or many, many other ways of getting to that clean energy economy. It is the policy. And the policy has to take place at the state level and certainly at the national level. So I think this uh, war, this wake up call, if you will, will uh, activate those who don't, haven't seen the absolute necessity to transition away from fossil fuels. The other aspect of it is in every one of these challenges of our decarbonization, there's tremendous opportunity, opportunity for creating companies, jobs, and economic well-being for a lot of people. Uh, and so it's not a zero sum game. It's not, hey, you can have a healthy uh, climate or you can have a, a more uh, diverse energy portfolio, but you've got to sacrifice something. No, you can actually get win, win, wins for the, the uh, opportunities. In terms of going back on the, the key metals, the efficiency uh, in the production of uh, efficiency and use of materials in the production of EVs, for example, or solar power or wind turbines has gotten tremendously better as we have developed industries and industrial processes. We're using far less materials. So will that uh, immediately uh, allay our fears about uh, price, price gouging or increased prices of uh, raw materials? No, but it will do a, it'll go a long way to uh, reduce uh, the effect on the pace of, uh, the, uh, of the transition to a new clean energy economy. Thank you, Admiral. Okay, final question, I think, um, and that's from Dana Noor from the Boston Globe, talking about price gouging, gouging, not too sure how to pronounce that here, um, how the fossil fuel companies have been acting um, over the past few weeks and months, as well as in, in this current crisis, uh, um, and some states calling that out and investigating that, including Massachusetts. What do the panelists, like what, what's the view on those, uh, those claims? Anybody wanna come in on that question? On the record, no? Well, I mean, uh, so, so I, I, just to differentiate between methane gas and gasoline at the pump, um, there, there is, there has been price pressure from increased LNG exports out of the United States on uh, methane gas, you know, used for home heating, et cetera, uh, for power plants. But that's a separate issue from gas prices. So I'm not sure if you're referring to prices for gasoline in Massachusetts or prices for uh, methane gas. Uh, okay, actually, and, and I'm just looking in the, um... In the chat, apparently Biden has just spoken on um, the during his speech announcement on Russian oil. He too said the current crisis highlights the need for clean energy investment. We make America independent of energy provided by countries like Russia, and we've got to, to deprive tyrants like Putin of the weapon of fossil fuels. So, and he said to quote, "This is the goal we should be racing towards." So, um, some some good news there. Okay, so just final round, um, uh, Mahara, do you want to come in on the fossil fuel uh, industry question? Sure, just, just briefly. And as I mentioned in my remarks, you know, we, we have seen the fossil fuel industry continue to make record profits year after year as gas prices rise. So instead of helping, you know, Americans at the pump, the fossil fuel industry is continuing to exploit this crisis to make even more money and, and lock in a, a fossil fuel future. Okay, and finally, I think just wrapping this up, Maria, you didn't get a chance to answer the, is Europe ready to ramp up their renewables? And what are some of the obstacles facing the renewable energy sector, particularly the volatile input prices? Yeah, I, th I think I came in on this with, uh, so just to recap, the solar industry is definitely ready to support the ambition um, with wind. It is a bit more challenging given the surging uh, nickel and, and steel prices, uh, but uh, there, um, 
double down on 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 enabling green and transparent uh, supply supply and value chains um, is 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 one of the priorities to be worked on to make this to make this deliver and and this is definitely possible. Um, I wanted to very quickly come on on um, maybe the lessons the US could learn from from the crisis the EU is now facing um, in the energy space. Um, I think we all see that. Uh, the, those most vulnerable to, to the uh, price hikes are, are, are in the end vulnerable consumers and and maybe one of the main messages this this really sends across the Atlantic is uh, that uh, focusing on demand is uh, one of the uh, it should be one of the key priorities for the US as well. Uh, we see that the US, of course, is in the privileged position of being a fossil fuel producer itself. Uh, but the thing is, uh, just as with oil, the gas prices are increasing and globalizing and ramping up produce, uh, production uh, in the US will not will not help bring down global oil and gas prices as much as it as is needed to um to alleviate the pressures on the consumers these prices now respond to geopolitical tensions not to the volumes of production which means instead of thinking about the supply side uh it, it is really necessary to think through how to support um the uh the vulnerable groups how to make uh, sure the demand uh, is is in control uh, and their focus on energy efficiency is absolutely essential and so there are really lot is, is really lots to learn from the EU um, and and these lessons are not in the fossil fuel um, space um, maybe one last uh, comment on 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 the question that has been um, put in the chat on uh, high prices on critical raw materials and whether they uh, will remain uh, permanent or not? Um, I don't see this happening for for two uh, very uh, very uh, simple reasons. Uh, the uh, the one is um, the development of the global oil prices, which are as I said, they are, are reacting to not the to not to the supply crunches. They now are reacting to the um, the geopolitical shocks. And uh, I may say, even though the ban on oil, for example, has not been made in place yet it uh, it is basically already counted in into the surge of oil prices because that's what investors has been uh, has been reckoning uh, will happen anyway um and and the supplies of other materials are uh, to some extent also linked to the to the oil prices the second thing is when we talk about um, cutting off russian supplies we are for now talking about this direct dependence on the fossil fuel and raw material supplies that are um, that are bringing a lot of foreign currency inflows uh, for the regime to fund the war. Uh, this is not the case largely for for these supplies of other materials. Nickel is among them, um, and uh, also we need to take into account that. Uh, the, the supply and value chains for these resources are much more globalized. So when we're talking about production of, of wind turbines or any other equipment, it's not, not just produced in Europe, it is produced in China and transported all over the world as well. And Russia will not definitely not think about cutting these strategic supplies and, and um, damaging the relations with even more countries than it already has. So, um, so maybe I will stop here. Good, good points. Okay, I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative and extend for a few more minutes since questions are still coming in. So if you if you bear with me. Um, so Maria, while you have the mic, uh, Sarah from E&E puts, you know, puts a point, uh, makes a finer point of it. Russian oil is 3% of US's crude oil imports. Russian gas is 40% of Europe's gas consumption. So we're, you know, we're not comparing like with like. And, and I know, you know we're a climate change uh, think tank here. We see what we want to see. Um, do you honestly feel, right? Um, you've listened to the press conference, you've looked at the numbers. You also look at the system, right? You know, someone said baseload is an old outdated concept. We're looking to the future. Do you feel like Europe is doing enough and it is up to this task, right? I mean, it feels like we've been here before in 2008. Does this time feel different to you? And is Europe ready? You know, what you've seen and heard today, uh, how are you feeling about Europe's ability to, to meet this crisis? Um, on the ability itself, uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic, to be honest, because now we see what, what has been missing all these years is the political will to act. And uh, rather than uh, the what has uh, uh, happened is the EU has not been up to this or has not been doing enough for all these years. Uh, and that is the main problem. Uh, I, I think it is it, it is now given the ambition that it uh, puts out in such a short time frame. Um, 
it is uh, it is taking a right approach, but much more needs to be done, obviously, particularly on spelling out the uh, demand side measures, particularly on spelling out the concrete benchmarks for funding on, on efficiency side for the social packages for the vulnerable consumers. So in terms of, of more concrete actions, uh, a lot, a lot of work is ahead of the European Union, but the ambition level is is about right uh, at the moment, I would say. Anybody else want to come in uh, from the panel on that or any other questions before? Uh, Claire, I would yeah. uh, want to comment. I saw a a question about uh, Europe rethinking uh, nuclear power. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, uh, this has been a long-standing uh, discussion after Fukushima Daiichi, uh, Germany decided to uh, start the close down process of their plants. They are now thinking about uh, reopening. Uh, I think that <clears throat> careful analysis and, and uh, careful uh, engineering, uh, taking a business case analysis of what are the costs, what are the benefits and what are the risks of, uh, of uh, restoring uh, nuclear power for Europe, uh, really uh, for the United States as well. Uh, really is an imperative, imperative uh, discussion. And my personal uh, view on it is that it has to be part of a portfolio of clean energy, if done well. And uh, I recognize the dangers we're seeing this uh, play out during this war against uh, Ukraine uh, with uh, the, uh, the four nuclear power plants in Ukraine being threatened by Russian forces. That should not define the future of nuclear power in Europe or, or otherwise. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we could do a whole other session, I think, on uh, nuclear. I think we've answered most questions. And as I say, if you haven't had a chance or you think of other questions, please do feel free uh, to drop us a line. Uh, the emails are in the media advisory or press at e3g.org. Um, this is sort of, I think, the ongoing conversation. I would just say in wrapping up, I think when you look at history, I mean, um, Whenever there's been such a shock, right, you see shifts in energy supply and then a whole overlay of economics and geopolitics on top of that shift. You mentioned nuclear, I think, you know, when you look at the in response to the Suez crisis in 1956, nuclear came to the fore and the, the shocks in the 70s, again, a shift in new geopolitics. It feels like that's what we're witnessing now, a shift, hopefully in the right direction, in our view, towards the clean energy transition and for sure. Uh, it won't be easy, um, there will be challenges, uh, but where there's the political will, hopefully there's the way, and we have to watch to see what new geopolitics gets overlaid on top of this shift. Uh, thank you for your time. I wanna thank uh, Climate Nexus for helping to organize this and our uh, panelists for their contributions. Um, and thank you for joining. And we look forward to continuing the conversation in the days and weeks ahead. But when one wonders what one can do to help the Ukrainian uh, people, I think we can give money uh, and we can also cut our energy demand and take part in this, uh, in this, in this fight and this shift. And I think hopefully not whinge about it. So I'm gonna end on that note. Thank you everybody for your time and look forward to seeing you all again. Goodbye.